So um, thank you all for being here. Uh, welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for, for being here. One of the things that I um, that I am trying to um, since my the new book is coming in very quickly. Uh, again, I think there's a lot. My sense is that this acceleration is because um, the information contained within the book needs to be out ASAP. So I've been talking to some of my friends. It, it's, again, it's book two and three. The third book being the next book is going to be, it's already basically written. It just needs to be formatted. It's all the prayers and meditation that I have channeled for the past almost 15 years. So it's all of them together in one collection. So, uh, but where I am right now is that I had conversation about editors, not editors, but the publishers and, um, and even a literary agent. And I've spoken to several people who are in that business. And I'm, if other friends of mine were authors, and the conclusion for me at this moment is that maybe what I really need, because if you go to a publisher, as I understand it, and they finally agreed to represent you, you're going to give the right away for them for a period of time for them to have the book. And it will take them two to three years before the book gets published. I don't think the world has two to three years to wait for that information to go out. So I will probably <laughs> again self-publish, but what I will need this time is a multimedia manager or somebody who has multimedia, a, a promotion person to help promote the information and spread it. So this is an investment I have to make. And I think that's the right approach for me because the, the, what I understood as well from somebody who had, who had a deal with the publisher, the publisher does not promote your book. You have to promote it yourself. You have to find somebody else to do it. So if you're doing it the so-called traditional way, the publisher will not see you until you get an agent. That will take several months. Then the agent and then the publisher will see you. If the publisher agrees, the publisher then will give you a deal you have to give you the rights away to them and they can do whatever they want with it for the number of years that you give it to them. And, and they might decide depending on the kind of, let's say you have a following of, a, and then look at your following. If you have a following of 250,000 people, they might decide, okay, the first run we're gonna do, the first edition, we're gonna do 2,000 or 200 cop, uh, 20,000 copy. We can sell about 20,000 from your people. So particularly for spiritual book, it's not regular book, it's for spiritual books. So I'm gonna have multiple conversation with people who are doing um, uh, spiritual uh, publishing, uh, self-publishing as well, to get a better idea on how to position myself in a better way. Um, I wanted also tonight to talk about what I've been writing about. And uh, I'm going to start first by reminding you of the emotional intelligence, the social intelligence, and the spiritual intelligence, and how that connects to the processing of our karma. So the emotional intelligence, what the inner work, is the most underrated in the spiritual community path to follow because there's a lot of people who think, and I see them on social media all the time, uh, who are calling themselves light workers or uh, star seeds and whatever it is, rainbow children, whatever they want to call themselves, who actually believe that because they identify in their head as Bambi or whatever it is that they will identify as spiritual beings, that somehow the transit we're going through osmosis, the light will take them without them doing any real work to merit this uh, admittance into a higher realm. 
I hate to say this, these people are completely wrong. The real work, and I remember when I was in the mystery school, this is going back when I was in my 18, 17, 18, 19, when I first entered the mystery school, I entered in between 17 and 18 years old. And I remember very clearly, they kept talking about the work and the answers within and all of that. At the time I was just, I just about to enter college, I thought the work they were talking about, because they were sending me lessons on a weekly basis that I had to study in my sanctum and uh, breath control exercises, initiation, um, all kinds of psychic um, uh, stuff to do. And I thought the work had to do with me di being disciplined to apply myself to all of this. Of course, my energy body grew. A lot of things were accomplished and it was beneficial for me at the time. But I never really understood what they meant by the work. When I came with Dr. Stone, fast forward now to uh, uh, 2000 and in the 2000, the early 2000, when I encountered Dr. Stone, 2001, and I studied, I began to study with him, I, he, he talked about the inner work. Now, very similar to the mystery schools, he approached the idea of an emotional wellness as if the mind can control your emotion, that having an emotional body and reacting emotionally was a bad thing. Because the way he presented it and understood it, presented it he, instead of doing the kind of internal dialogue with our feelings that I'm asking you to do, what he presented to all of us were lists. For example, he talked about the 12 archetypes, their qualities, quality of the, let's say, the inner child, quality of the destroyer, quality of the seducer, quality of the, and he, after describing them, then he gave you a positive aspect as it reflects in you and a negative aspect. So these are subconscious things. And as you read it, you are supposed to emotionally identify whether you're manifesting at the moment the positive or the negative aspect of the seducer, the positive and the negative aspect of the de destroyer, the, uh, uh, the wise man, the, the mother or the father, the child, etc. So a lot of it was highly subjective, meaning we are all masters of self-deceit and many of us want to see ourselves in a good light. And some of us are not going to admit what may be glaring to anybody else but we will not have made it to ourselves. So there was the archetype, there was the, the, the chakra system, positive, negative aspect, all the chakras, positive aspect, negative aspect of the tree of life, and all these various lists. And the problem with that is that over time, what actually occurred is that for all of us who were following the system, I didn't know any better. That's the only system I knew. And I benefited from it, I have to tell you. I did benefit from it. Uh, what actually ended up happening is that over time, I had a... Um, um, there were... There would be emotions that I would experience at times, depending on the kind of external trigger that was in front of me, that were not on the list. There are things that were not on the list at all. And when I asked for guidance from him and the other leaders of the, of the group, he, they would tell me that it's an internal saboteur and you need to do X, Y, Z to take care of it and try to reprogram it. And it was always the idea that if you know the positive and the negative aspect, let's say of the seducer, and you think the negative aspect of the seducer is in you, so you create a, a, a mental bubble around it and you're asking that part of you, that emotional part of you, before it can manifest, it means in your external life as a reaction, it needs to have your conscious approval. I can tell you that it was very clunky and it never worked correctly. Not for me, not for even the teachers in that community 
<clears throat> that were teaching it because I saw a lot of them <clears throat> emotionally unravel, giving certain kind of triggers that they receive. I witnessed it with, with my own eye. So um, I am, um, and I've been guided by spirit since the passing of Dr. So in 2005. I've been guided by spirit and I moved away on my own and letting spirit guide me. I've been guided now to do work in a very different way. And it has to do with the dialogue, believing that the, the inner intelligence that we have in us is the greatest gift that we have. There is no such thing as a bad emotion or bad feeling. And in fact, when you feel the, the stronger the emotion, the emotional reaction is, the more you should pay attention to it by having a dialogue and going within yourself and sit with it and see if you can begin to um, understand to the dialogue, to the query, what that part of you, because whatever the, and the way it works is that you go, here is the problem that was with Dr. Stone. The list was created by Dr. Stone. Dr. Stone's spiritual psychology and all of his blocks were very specific to him. That was his list. The way he described the positive and innocent aspect of all these archetypes, that's not the way these archetypes are going to show in me or you or anybody else. That's the problem. So, because my journey, my descent, and now ascent back to God is so unique, the kind of trauma, the kind of fear I have, the kind of uh, uh, separation consciousness, the kind of false belief that I've created, are very specific to me. And this is true of all of us, where you need manifestation of God. So, to create a template and think that everybody is going to fit in this, in this, in a box somewhere, is 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 not correct. It's a personal and individual thing. And it requires that we sit with ourselves and begin to do this internal dialogue. It, it, again, going, particularly when you have a strong emotional reaction and you're trying to converse with that part of you, initially it's like walking into an emotional minefield. It's terrifying, it's scary, but understand that the reason why the emotion is so big. It's because there is a secret or a key to, an, to a tremendous growth that inside of it. Now it's showing up as a toxic, it's express, being expressed in a toxic way, but that toxic way in which it's being expressed is the key. So initially when you show up and you try to query the emotion and you're asking, what am I feeling? Where is this feeling located? Um, uh, is it inside or outside? Is it one feeling? Is it a combination of feelings? Is it, what's the first feeling, the second and the third? You know, all these normal quick questions that we have been guiding you into doing. So as you're doing all of this and you wait every time, the, the point being, you have a higher intelligence in you, a real healer, that when you query and ask questions, and if you stay very quiet, an impression or a response of some kind will come to you to guide you into the management of this emotion. Now, it's not going to happen in one sitting because a lot of time when the emotion is really big and the reaction is really big, it's behind a wall. It's the wall of Jericho, as I've described uh, to you before meaning that it's an impenetrable thing. And if you try to frontally hack at it, but like jo uh, uh, Joshua, you will, you will not be able to knock it down. The only way to, to do this is to do the query daily. And like, 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 like Joshua, you have to circle it. You have to circle Jericho. You have to keep querying it, querying it. And this may take a month or two months, whatever time it takes. And one day suddenly you're, Inner intelligence, and the reason why your inner intelligence blocked it, it's because it's a survival mechanism typically that's created because 
something was misunderstood or you felt threatened and you had to survive. And because of the threat and the survival, it, it placed it behind a wall to block the memory or the, 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 the vulnerability, the brokenness. Your, your human psyche is the most fragile thing in the world, but it's the most self-healing. So that, that part that was fractured, your higher self moved in to protect it, it created a bubble. And it isolated a sap for it. When you circle it by asking the creator over and over again, you're telling your higher self, your God self, I am ready now. I need to know what's inside. I need to recover. If it's a block memory, it's a feeling that's hiding behind many other feelings. I need to know what's inside. And as you keep circling it and circling it, and circling it, eventually it will open up and you will know exactly what it is. It's typically a vulnerability, a false belief, a way, a survival way that you're going about your entire life to do something that is not an ascended way going forward, particularly for where we are right now. And you need to correct course. You need to now apply an ascended principle to realign your consciousness to, instead of being fragmented, to repair and redemption. So that's the emotional intelligence part. Now, following that, is the, the social intelligence. Well, maybe I should stop here and ask you if you have any questions. Any questions, any comments you may have? I can cite your personal examples, okay? I talked about it this morning, but... Uh, I remember while doing one of my queries, I kept sensing, then 10, I kept sensing on my left pelvic bone, inside of my left pelvic bone, there was a feeling and a sensation, a discomfort. I wouldn't call it the pain because pain is the wrong description. It was just a discomfort. And uh, I kept on feeling it for like almost two and a half to three months. I kept on going back, querying it. What am I feeling? What kind of feeling is this? Uh, over and over again, I got nothing. Literally crickets. And one day, I remember being at the gym and after doing my yoga stretch, and I, I query again. And then this time around, I asked something very specific. As I was connecting the feelings, I let my consciousness drop into it. I was sensing it, and I'm like, have I ever felt this way before? And I could hear a voice in my head, a bell whisper, yes, every time you give. Now, this sent me into panic because I realized that whatever that was, every time I'm giving, I'm feeling this. I got concerned. And uh, I, whatever, who, my higher self was responding to myself, my God self that was responding to me, must have realized my panic and said then next to me, uh, said after that, I don't require this from you. And it continued by saying, I, I was kind of like, huh? Like, like Scooby-Doo, like a, huh? And, and, and I remember, <clears throat> That part of me said, if I were to gift everyone on the planet everything that they want, there would be left over in me infinity times infinity. And I remember the feeling because I was focused on the pelvic and all that. When he said infinity times infinity, my whole head exploded. It, this is the feeling that like I was expanded because I was trying to calculate what infinity times infinity. It's the first time I ever heard it. I was trying to calculate what infinity times infinity. How big is that? And then all of these other things were, were flying in because I got expanded, I got shifted so big. 
And after a moment, I remember I sat very quietly and said, what do I do? Because I realized the false belief. And there was a false belief there that showed up at the moment when it says, I don't require this from you. It was that as a Catholic boy, very religious person in my early life, I believe what I was told by my religious upbringing, that resources on the planet are rare. And in order for you to give to someone like Jesus, you have to sacrifice something. That was, and this is a word even today that I'm using, and I have to retrain my consciousness, my mind to never use that word again. Because if I'm giving from infinity and ten times infinity, there is no sacrifice. Because Pierre is not giving, it's God that's giving. So I um it took me. I, I got truly scared because I realized up to that point, my entire life, I was giving and, and it turns out that every time I gave, there was a part of me that orchestrated a loss of some kind because it had to be a sacrifice. Whether it's energetic, whether it is emo emotional, where there was a loss and that's what I was feeling. And when this infinity times infinity came in, it became my new axis, my new belief system. So here is this one that says you have to you have to experience a loss every time you give. Here is this new thing that says, and because the voice said to me, give from infinity times infinity. Give from me. Don't give from yourself, give from me. It was an immense shift. None of that stuff I'm telling you right now was on any list from Dr. Stone or from anybody else because this is my own personal descent and ascent journey. And it's customized to me. This is why you have to talk to your inner intelligence because that inner intelligence is the only force an energy system that can help you to the inner work and give you the right answers. So for a week and a half, I was literally in seventh heaven. Everything was like, you know, euphoria because I had this new thing, that new access. Then I begin to feel a week and a half later on the other pelvic, as I was going in meditation, that there was something else there. But that one resolved, didn't take three months, it resolved almost within a day. Because I realized it was my desire to receive and giving the same false toxic belief of limited resources, it too understood, misunderstood. So the way I was, Processing it at the time was that because of limited resources, again, people don't have, and therefore I don't need to receive anything from anyone. And when you do this, but not receiving from your friend, your neighbor, you also block God from giving to you. It's the same muscle. So when I connected back to my higher self and my God self, and I asked, so what do I do now? And my God self says, give, give, and receive from infinity times infinity. So nowadays, as I'm reminding this, I'm writing this, I'm using this as an example in the book, I realize that when I go in the absolute certainty symbol, I'm using it, that's my new mantra. I give and I receive from infinity times infinity. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna go even further. In Buddhism, there are, there are six realms, okay? There's the realm of, the, uh, there's the hell, the realm of the hungry ghost, the hell realm, 
the realm of the animals, the realm of the um, of human, the realm of the jealous God, and the realm of gods, what we call Elohim. And then there's the enlightened one, the, the sixth world. These five worlds, out of those five worlds, the one that's the highest is the realm of the gods, the realm of the Elohim. When there is such, it's the realm of the, of the holy people who are like gods to us. The people who exist in that realm, the individual, the entity that exists in that world, know through and through in every part of their body that they give and receive from infinity and infinity. This is why most of them are immortal. Any comments, any questions you may have? Now, your customized test may not, is gonna, not going to be mine, but I'm using myself as an example to allow you to understand how I process something that was you. That was a huge thing for me, and it still is. It's something I'm still working through because I spent my entire life uh, so far on this in this incarnation believing this, this erroneous and this wrong thing. And I had to shift all of it into something else. So I'm still transmuting all of that false belief. You know, the regeneration of your cell, because the moment you say you're giving from yourself, you don't want to receive from anyone because, you know, the moment you do this, you're not going to receive love. You're not going to receive abundance. You're not going to receive healing from God. You're, you're blocking all of it. And you're on your own. You, you've created, this is the greatest act of separation and fragmentation. You're refusing to accept what is the truth. Everything is connected to infinity times infinity. And there is no loss. It's just transfer of energy. There is never any loss. Because nothing is created, nothing is destroyed. There is no loss. Now, the social intelligence part relates to us moving into the next phase of this, which is through our amandala, which exists in our limbic system, which is a very chatty kind of like organ. And a mirror, no neuron that exists in the amandala, we can, without seeing, without hearing, we can feel and know what other people are feeling. Now, the way most, uh, social intelligence begin, once you have done enough work on yourself, you begin to notice things about people. So it begins initially by watching people body language. If they close their arm, they seem closed. If they're open, they seem different. It, uh, the tone of their voice, the, the, there are all kinds of clues that you can notice in somebody and you can or some, sometimes what they're omitting, where they're looking, where they're not looking it begins to tell you a lot about where someone's feelings and emotions are. But in addition to that, there is also um, your amygdala begin to tell you things. If you begin first by pay paying attention to the body language and the kind of external clues, you will quickly begin to know other things as well. There's a reason why people who are socially intelligent seem to attract around them a lot of people and people seek their counsel all the time because people get answers. One of the things that, 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 that's very important to all of us because everyone on the planet hear, but when we hear sound, most of us process it to, look to the frontal lobe and the cerebral cortex. We analyze it as a way for us to be tactical, cunning, and to continue to survive. 
So when somebody talks to us, we're always trying to figure out an angle to, to scan them for danger, for traps, and we're constantly trying, if they're saying something, to appear more intelligent than them. This is frontal lobe. And the reason for the mind and heart coherence is that when we do this, we can begin to now listen. And this is where the dialogue with self begin because if you really listen, what's gonna happen is that you, when you, when you, listening is about, it's not about being tactical. It's not about counting being or surviving. It's about interdependence and it's about understanding. And when you're listening, let's say you're having a conversation with somebody, you say your piece. And when somebody is about to talk, you quiet down and you allow what, you have no judgment as to what they're gonna say. You have no stake. You're not trying to up them or be the top dog. You're simply trying to understand because there is a symbiosis between you and everybody else around you. And when that happens, you really listen. You are now a witness to everyone else because you're not trying to demonstrate to everybody that you're the brightest. You are simply trying to understand where everybody stands and this is, and when you do this to somebody and you really listen to them, their amygdala trusts you. Because all of a sudden, for the first time, maybe for them, they feel heard. And this is a huge thing because to, to allow somebody the neutrality and the non-judgment so that they could, be, they could feel that they are being really heard is a huge healing gift. Because if somebody can sense that you're judging them and you're gonna tell them, well, I, I wouldn't do it this way. You should have done this. People are weak and they're vulnerable. And they're gonna act in whatever way because the world, there's no script left in the world. Everything is being thrown out. And if, we, if you can understand this and accommodate people for what, and, and acknowledge whatever stage that they're, they're, they're at as something that's non-judgmental and something that you welcome and that you're trying to encourage so that they can eventually grow. It doesn't mean that if they're in chaos and they're trying to disrupt your life, that you're gonna let them disrupt your life. It's not codependency. But it's a matter of when you're conversing with them, you can begin to be socially intelligent and you can sense. Because again, we're all masters of self-deceit. When, when I talk to people, and I'm, because I've, I've shared this with you before, the only gift that I have is that I listen better than most people. I have morphogenic listening. And when I'm listening that way, I, a lot of times I'm, I'm quiet, I'm listening, and somebody's telling me the story and they're telling me and I'm listening. And unbeknown to me, I remember one client telling me this, Pierre, you, you, you have such clarity. And I, I remember he said that you have such clarity. And one of the other things that you do as well, that, that's kind of sometimes I'm stunned. I'm talking to you. And as you're listening to me, your mouth is mimicking the words that I'm saying. I don't, I don't know that I'm doing this. He said, you're so in sync with what I'm saying that there are moments where your, your, your mouth is mimicking exactly, silently, but you're mimicking exactly what I'm saying. When I'm listening to you, I am all ears. Nothing else exists for me in the universe. And when you listen to somebody that attentively, they trust you because they can feel the degree to which you're paying attention or, and how important you're making their journey and their story to you. And suddenly they begin to open up 
And more to the point for me when I'm listening this way, I, um, because people lie to themselves, we all do, including me. So when I'm listening to somebody that way, and I can tell in the story that they say something, and then there's a jump, and then something else is being said. And then the typically spring when there's a jump, a little vignette shows up for me, like a dead dream. Something shows up to tell me they are not talking about this. They skipped over this item. This item. There's a jump. And uh, if they, if I'm coaching them, if I'm talking to somebody normally, I'm not going to mention this. Let's say a business thing. I'm not going to say anything. Uh, but if I'm coaching somebody and I see the jump, I can always say, go back. What did you mean about this? You said blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Could you go back and, and then they try to explain it? And then if the jump occur again, I then can illuminate what I'm seeing. I can bring to them to their mind, this is what I see. And then I step back and let them continue with their story. It's the same muscle. You're going to first begin by listening to yourself and listening to your higher self. It's the same muscle. And as you do this and you go deeper into the inner dialogue and so on and so forth, it gets transposed at some point to you being a better listener to everyone else around you. And as you do this, your magdala will trigger and you will be more socially intelligent. In its ultimate capacity, social intelligence, somebody who's socially intelligent, can not only listen well, but they can broadcast and then train the feeling that they have of their own freedom, liberation, to, to the person that or the individuals that are in their circle of influence. This is what the 144,000 are supposed to be in the end. It's to broadcast it through the amygdala and through social intelligence. Any questions, any comments? Now, spiritual intelligence implies that at some point, as we descended and cascaded down from, from, from God, from 5D into, well, we God is higher than 5D, but, but from 5D level to 4D to 3D, as we cascade it down the, uh, the, the dimensional scales, uh, we fragment into multiple of 12 for every dimension we drop. So we were 144 fragments together, broken down into 12 into 4D. If you imagine a hand with, instead of five fingers, 12 fingers, 5D. For, uh, from 5D to 4D. From 4D, each of the fingers break into another 12, into 3D. So total 12 times 12, 144. We have a total of 144 fragments. But each of these fragments, you and I are the incarnation of one of these points called soul extension. And I have 143 other fragments that are out there. You do, everybody else does. And each of these other fragments may be incarnated or disincarnated in this dimension, in another dimension. But we shattered ourselves, we dumb ourselves down, we release gift abilities, and more importantly, higher emotion. Because everything that's energy is emotion. Why are we doing all this work to begin with? Because we are trying to make sure that our energy body or emotional body has no ripple in it and it's cohesive and can move together. As we do these queries for social for emotional intelligence, what happens is that as everything that we resolve, it 
it it it organized the entire or an entire energetic field. And it connects us with re or real intention so that we don't intend and unintend three to four times per minute. Now, when, because we know what the 12 higher emotions are, you have peace, you have love, you have uh, control, you have gratitude, you have wisdom, you have all these higher emotions. What we're gonna do for spiritual intelligence is that we're gonna sit and connect to let's say peace. And what you're gonna do is that you're gonna slowly breathe in deeply and slowly, and you're gonna ask yourself, if I were at peace, now you're querying that part of you that's already at peace, because that fragment is removed from you. It, it's shattered. They are shattered everywhere, but because there's no time and space, energetically, you are one. Your fragments are everywhere, but you're one. You can still connect to quantum entanglement. So what you do is that you, you query, if I were at peace, what would I feel in my body? Show me the peace that you know. Teach me how to be at peace. And every time you've asked this, you, you ask this, you wait for a response or a sensation or something to come in, a feeling to come in. Again, like Jericho, you keep circling it. You do it every day. And you do this for peace, you do it for love, you do it for all 12 emotions in the world. And by the time you are done, as you do this all the time, major breakthroughs are going to come for you. You would hear word, you will feel feelings that you never felt before. That part of you that's, that's out there, that's scattered, will begin to remind you the gratitude that they know will remind you the harmony that they know will remind you of the wisdom that they know remind you of the justice that they know all the high emotion the victory that and all of that will 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 come back to you and every time it comes back and if it comes back the right way you will reassemble yourself and you will become your monad your true self Any comments, any questions? We're using the same basic principle. It's the same red thread that we are using, weaving through all these various exercises. It's the same dialogue and query that we use in the emotional intelligence, that we will use in the social intelligence, that we are now using in the spiritual intelligence. Now, if there are any, if there are no question, I'm going to jump into the next topic, which is how that connects to our karma. So remember I said to you what happened is that you get an external trigger of some kind, particularly now with the planet transiting. Many of us, are gonna get major triggers. I went to my major triggers uh, two years ago. I remember being so scared and so afraid that I sat in my apartment for one time for three days straight because I was afraid that every time a delivery guy was coming, UPS or whoever, people who order food, that it was somebody trying to harm me. I was so afraid. 
And this external trigger revealed to me a lot of things about my own spiritual psychology and how broken I felt inside and vulnerable because of all the shift and everything else that was happening in the world. And I had no control over it. I couldn't control it. I couldn't save or rescue anyone. And more importantly, for personally for me, I felt unsafe. I felt vulnerable. And I felt um, in, that I didn't have any security. So all of these things were external trigger. Now this external trigger that, you know, whether the sound of the elevator or whatever it is that was being created, it created a strong emotional reaction. In me. And of course that emotional reaction was being fanned and agitated by the archons because that's what they do. They pretend they take 1% of, a few percentage of your stuff and they inflict it. So as this emotion, this strong emotion were coming through, I, I remember that I was, um, it took me a minute because uh, th that one time where I was in the apartment for three days, I, by, the, by the second day, I remember saying to myself, I wasn't like this two days ago. I was at peace. I was at rest. Whatever I'm going through, it's 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 a lesson and it's going to be a temporary thing. I will go back to the peace. By the way, this helped me tremendously. Because when you're in panic, again, there is a difference between depression and panic. When you're depressed, you're lethargic. You don't want to move. You're incapable of lifting your head or doing anything. When you're in panic, you're overactivated and agitated, and you're ready to jump at everything or attack everything. Now, you can, you can be uh, a manic, uh, uh, you can be bipolar. You could move between being depressed and being panicked. I want you to understand this because when you're feeling these emotions and you're processing them, you need to know what state that you're at so that you can, because each one of them, you have to address them very differently. If you're in panic, you need to figure out a way to calm yourself down, to breath control. To well, If you're depressed, it's a different thing that you need to do. So the external is going to trigger you. And as, as it triggers you, you have to figure out a way to elevate above it and to activate in you uh, an understanding that will allow, because what happens is that whatever it is that's activating you, if it's a person that's talking to you, a boss or some, some kind of situation, that external event that's triggering you is connected to your karma. Because a lot of people can say, for example, why is it, Okay, the word karma in, in, in Sanskrit means to make or to do. In Hebrew, it's tikkun, and it means to repair or to correct. It does not mean to be a victim. But the way we understand karma in the normal lexicon of the planet, karma means to us, I am a victim. Things are happening to me because of things I did in my past life. I don't know why in this lifetime, ever all the time, the same thing. If you have things that are repeating themselves over and over again, the first time they happen, you may ignore it. Bad luck. But if it keeps repeating itself, you have to understand it's your karma. And you need this, there's a correction that you need to apply. And most of the time, if it's your karma, there's something that you're not seeing. Because in when we are involved with the karma and the pendulum swing going back and forth, we keep seeing ourselves as being innocent. We don't see the stuff, the 50%, how we co-created the toxic dynamic. So when you're facing with a karmic situation, again, externally driven, okay? A car accident or 
something in your family that before every member of your family. Uh, so, you know, like a, whatever that shows up for all of you. Uh, you end up marrying the same type of people or the, you end up having the same kind of, you know, and whatever it is, whatever that karma is, you need to acknowledge your part in it. Now, most of us do not have the insight of the vision to actually see it. Now, the most that the average person will have is that they have an insight or they'll have a feeling, for example, that when they meet somebody, I've met, I know this person, I've met them before, even if it's the first time you've ever met them, you feel familiar to them or they feel familiar to you or there are other people you feel repelled, completely repelled by. You, you, you don't want to have anything to do with them. Again, karma. You've tangled with them before and it was not a pleasant thing. So, but there is an energetic connection. Remember, emotional body and energy. There's an energetic connection between you and them that connects you. This is the common bond. And so we have to figure out a way to uh, balance this common bond by a lot of time it's it takes years. And as a matter of fact, we are not as smart as we think we are. When I know, I have karma with all my students. When I know, for example, a few students comes in and I know I have karma with them and I don't have clarity as to what the karma is, I have to be very careful because a lot of time I also allow them, I give them a lot of grace and allow them to create chaos around me. I remember one particular instance, this man was creating all this chaos around us and I, I, for three years, I know I had come out with him. I just couldn't figure out what it was. And it took me a minute to figure it out. And when I did, I, um, a lot of home opener, a lot of, and I finally was, I figured it out. I had to say to him a couple of things. And it was very simple. I had to say to him, I owe you absolutely nothing. This is what I didn't say in that time of planet. I owe you nothing. And I'm walking away from you. And I owe you nothing. And then that was it. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm my and I felt incredible relief. I felt like I became light. I remember another instance, this one is a, was a woman in which I, and I spoke about this this morning too. I, I remember the incident very clearly. This woman was, um, was in my circle and she badmouthed me, she betrayed me. She said to everyone else around me that um, I, I was, uh, that the book that I wrote, she wrote it, she played, she went on and said all these crazy things that were completely demonstratively incorrect. She didn't author anything. She didn't. She was. She was. She helped edit two chapters in the book. It was not the complete anyway. Long and short, it was a lie. And but it was somebody that I care for very deeply, and I had um, given this person. There were many times when she was very ill, and I. I, I I helped to out um, by, by providing her with healing. And it's somebody that I care very deeply because I had fragments of memory of us being in Egypt. So I, 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 when I discovered this, I felt literally that I was stabbed in the stomach, in, 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 in my gut, above my belly. I felt stabbed like somebody knifed me. And it was very powerful and very, it was hurtful. We separated ways. I was saying the Honopuno for two years. And I noticed one morning as we're taking the shower, I was still in my head, I'm saying the Honopuno. And I can, every time she comes in my mind, I keep saying the Honopuno. And I couldn't get rid of it. And I remember saying to myself, and I'm, I'm pay attention to this, please. Because I remember saying to myself, I'm not doing some, a good job at this. At this rate, I'm saying, please forgive me. I love you and I let go. It's not, I'm not letting go of nothing. I am not seeing something. 
So when I was done with the shower, I sat down and I meditated. And I remember asking myself, what is your 50% here? What is it that you did to this woman in a past life that you are not seeing? You were not a saint. You did something to her to cause her to react this way. What is your 50? What, what's your part in this? And when I was that honest with myself, the answer actually came within two days. I saw that I was this young pharaoh and all that. And uh, she was a he older teacher. And, and I was much more gifted. And I basically wasn't know it all. And I completely disregarded any advice or anything, any word, anything he had to say. I completely, like, I was an a-hole a to him. So the next day, when I said, please forgive me, I thought about myself and my behavior in that lifetime as being the offense. So please forgive me for this offense. I love you unconditionally now and I let go. And within a week, all of the toxicity that were connected to this had dissipated for me. And now I don't think of it at all except to use that situation as an example to teach you. Any questions, any comments? The reason I'm threading all of this together, it's because your karma is going to come, it's going to come fast, giving the acceleration and everything else that's going to what's happening in the planet. Outside things will trigger you, and you have to figure out a way to process them. Questions? Um, yes, Pierre, if you would uh, expand a little bit, please, on the karmic entanglement that you resolved on your side, if that relationship with that person did not then heal and you reconnect, does that mean that that person's entanglement had not resolved with you? Or was it not necessary to have a, a relationship anymore? because of the resolution of the karmic interview. You know, what I'm trying to say is that yes, yes. If, if there's not a rejoining of a relationship, does that mean that there is a not uh, a fulfillment of the, uh, whatever think, the resolution? Think of, it, think of it as a rubber band, okay? I'm holding one hand and they're holding the other hand. So what I did at that moment, once I did the one opener the right way, by now discovering what my offense was and asking for forgiveness specifically for that offense, I let go of the rubber band. So what I did is that I moved into neutrality. I became neutral to the situation. Now, she, whatever, let's say um, my energy was minus five, hers was plus five. So we connected. We were polarized to each other because of the honopuno and the forgiveness. Because the way you remove karma, it's only one way. You forgive yourself, you forgive others. There's only one way. It's forgiveness. So because of the forgiveness and the release of it, what happened is that instead of being minus five, I'm now zero. I'm therefore zero charge, and she cannot send her hook into me anymore. She will need, if she still desire to battle with somebody else, she will have to find someone else to create that dynamic with. But my part is done. Does that make any sense? Yes, it, of course. And what I'm still wondering is that that seems to say that that person that 
that you speak of, still maintained some animosity on a karmic level if uh, some people so will was, not join us. Some people will grow because of this. But it's not always the case. There are people who want to marinate in their rage and anger. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, I can't yeah. control that process. God can only reach them when they are ready. Their higher self can only reach them when they are ready to be reached. But my part is done. I'm not attached to this anymore. I'm done. It's my hope that they will resolve it and they will be okay with it. But I it I have to tell you, this is somebody, if I meet them again in this lifetime, both of these examples, I will not trust them. And by the way, the first man I talked about, right at the beginning of COVID, he called me out of nowhere for me, um, for me, uh, he, I want to call, call these numbers a block number. And the, it was so insistent, I kept not responding, not responding. After the sixth time, I picked it up, and when I picked it up, he was introduced himself again. Remember me, blah, blah, blah. So, so, so. He, I, I forgot he even existed. Or well, I guess I was going through the dark night of the soul around you, blah, 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 around that time. And what do you think about what's going on around the world? I said, well, the world is shifting and, you know, make some casual comment. Um, I, I want to ask for your forgiveness. When I said, well, you're forgiven. It's okay. It's all right. I'm, I've moved on. And then he's like, is it okay if we became friend again? And I'm like, I said, I remember specifically what I said to him. I thought about it for a moment and I said, okay, I'm going to be honest with you so that you don't waste your time and I don't waste my time. Given the way everything unraveled around what happened between you and me and the people around me, I don't trust you. And this is not something, I'm a Capricorn, it is loyalty and trust is key to me. And it's not something that I, in this lifetime, maybe in a future lifetime, but in this lifetime, I, 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 I will always be work, looking over my shoulder and waiting for betrayal. I can't trust you. I said to him, I, don't, I, I, I love you unconditionally. I wish you the best of luck and all the happiness in the world. But we cannot be friends. This is me. This is the way I, somebody else might have responded different, but I was being honest with my feeling at the time. That's the way, that's where I am. This was two years ago. Did that help, Janice? It was very interesting. I, uh, I'm thinking that uh, the person that the, 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 that did not come back to apologize or to to try to reinstate a relationship uh, maybe has completed it on uh, whatever the, the 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 strife was on her part has also completed it and no longer needs the relationship to carry out the karmic resolution I, 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 okay let me put it to you this way I don't think I'm gonna. Oh, I I know. I I'm just just trying to see an overview from both perspectives. Both from both I I'm I'm whatever her journey is. She needs to do it on her own. Yes, of course. My part is done. I'm 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 at rest. I'm okay with where I am, and I'm moving on. As yeah, you know, as a spiritual teacher. I don't know if you know this, but as a spiritual teacher, your karma is much bigger and much more complicated. In fact, a lot of people who have big spiritual teaching kind of like um, uh, uh, mission in this lifetime, before they start their public mission, they, they spend years working on themselves to prepare themselves so that they can be neutral to the students that are coming. Because your student, the same way Judas... Uh, betrayed crime, you will, people will betray you and people you trust and that you love. And it's so funny because I remember saying this to her multiple times before this whole betrayal. I could feel it coming. You see, the thing is that as a spiritual teacher as well, when somebody's going to betray you or do something like this, you can, you know it through social intelligence. 
And because they're also, you know, the connection between me and my student is extremely key to me. And it's, it's a bonding that's extremely important because I will go and battle for you in hell. And I battle for her because she was literally near death multiple times. I battle for her. So I knew that something was going to happen. And I remember saying to her several times, I said to her, I love you so deeply. And remember this. You can hurt me very easily because I love you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, um, that brings up, I'm sorry to prolong this, but it, it brings up another uh, thought. You mentioned Judas and, and this person. Maybe there was an agreement. Absolutely. That, that this would happen so that you could then remove or, or cleanse or balance, I guess is That's the word. Exactly. That's exactly my point. That's what I'm trying to teach you. That these people who you're seeing as your trigger, as the, the enemy, whatever you want to call them, that's triggering the karma, they are here to try to help you. Mm -hmm. that's, that's good. Thank you. I understand now. You understand? They are here. That was a gift. I didn't see that lifetime uh, up to that point. I didn't see myself as being the air hole. I didn't see it. And then when I saw it for her perspective or him I, I, in the past life, I, all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, I was such a, a complete jerk. I didn't see it. Oops. So he was an opportunity for me to let go of this. So you're going to have multiple experiences as karma gets accelerated where things are going to confront you and fall upon your lap. And you have to figure out all the time what's the toxicity. People are going to trigger creating things. And sometimes, and again, in her mind, what she was doing was justified. She believed what she said. Do you understand? Delusionally, she believed. You, you know the detail, Janice, more than anybody else. She actually believed what she was saying. Uh, I see, I see. She delusionally believed. I, yes. I that she was right. Because in her mind, she was looking at me as a being the same a-hole from almost 4,000 years, over 4,000 years ago, that is uh -huh. inflexible, that knows everything. Uh -huh. She's not looking at me at the facts as they presented themselves now. You see it? Got it. Yep. Thank you. And so in her, in her consciousness, it, it, she was looking at a mirage, not me of today. Hmm. Life is complex. Yes. And this, this is the way we are with everybody we have karma with. And when you have the wisdom and the insight and you, you understand and you know it, you, you, you now can say, okay, this is the situation. This is what I did. And this is why I humble myself. And I realized I was in the wrong. In, that past life, in the past life, I was in the wrong. Not today, but I was in the wrong in the past life. And I asked for forgiveness for that offense. Things are not black and white, are they? Not black, they are not black and white. There is yeah. always a 50%. That's and so you go into it neutrality, though. That's right. There's in order to access it. Yes. There's a part I contributed into, and I need to ask for forgiveness for it. Okay. And the moment that happened, I became zero point. It was no longer sting. All of that began to dissipate. Well, that's interesting. It's a hologram of all time being one at once. Yes, yes. And interestingly enough, as I said, I don't know this lifetime if I if our path were to cross in the future. I don't think I would trust her. Mm -hmm. I, I, we meant to be seen. But in the first instance I was describing with this man, 
when he contacted me, I didn't want, I, I, I checked my body, my energy body. I spoke with my own self. I'm like, I'm never going to trust this man. Never. But you mentioned the Archon influence that comes in to inflate um, a situation. Is this part of? Yes. Well, the Archon, um, well, in the first instance, I know for a fact this guy was highly influenced by Archon. And his behavior were completely conflated by the Archon. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the past life, I remember off planet, his father was a complete agent for the Archon. Mm. And I came to that uh, off planet to that to that planet to try to guide a whole bunch of people into a rebellion against what him and his family were doing. I see. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the, when you begin to accept that you have a 50% and there's a point and you're doing the query, you're going to remember. These flashes will come. Then, then For me, they don't come all at once, but there's a pieces of it stuck falling in. And with them, again, like Wall of Jericho, Within a matter of a few days, I, I will get a complete picture. I will understand. This is the way it was. This is what happened. This is what's being repeated now. Again, we echo, okay? We echo the same thing. But if I want to move forward, I'm going to stop the cycle of toxicity by closing the loop, by acting in an assembled way. Mm. Mm. But it wasn't just saying the whole Pono Pono to her before you identified your participation that would that would close that loop. You had to identify what past life happened, what, what event happened in past life. Exactly. Exactly. And and if, if some of you it may help you if you're having an issue, you can't remember the past life. You might seek somebody like me to get a past life reading to have the, to do for for the person to take you on a past life journey for you to remember. But the moment you get the past life and you remember, then you can move on. Because with that, you can do the, the whole open. The whole open is very broad. But but if you're saying please forgive me and you're still thinking I am a victim, you don't know what you're asking for forgiveness for. Because you don't see yourself as as being as having offended anyone. Not in this life, no. Exactly, because you don't remember. So if you cannot remember on your own, you need somebody to take you to a past life remembrance so that you can begin to understand. And once you get it, the, the, the healing happened very quickly. Mm hmm I highly recommend, by the way, I've experienced your past life regressions and I highly recommend it's a very valuable uh, tool. Yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. So so if we have those kind of experiences, it helps tremendously then to, and again, it took me two years. I should know better, right? I'm, I'm, I'm the teacher. But I was doing no puno for two years. Um, please forgive me every time she I think of her. And the more I, I did it, the more nothing was changed. I was still feeling raw, like I was stabbed. Until I did this. We all have a 50%. And when you can, when you're prepared and you're ready and you can see it, it it it, it should turn us up. The last piece that I want to bring in for today, I'm looking at the time. We can receive help from past life stuff from the calming board. Sometime when I do past life regression and the, the issue is so big, I often during the session sometimes bring the calming board in. I have to be guided. Sometimes they show up all before I even ask them. There's a group of beings that runs the comic board and they're 
very powerful uh, masters of forgiveness and love that can give us a higher view of a toxic situation and can broadcast to you the way for you to find, to create the healing. And in some instances, it's called, they can remove the karma, they can break the karma. It's not that they're breaking it. It's that they're giving you a higher perspective, a higher view, so that you can resolve it faster. It's like um, an acceleration. So we have in the comic board, the divine director is a cosmic being. We have Mother Mary, Huang Yin. We have Lady Nada, Lady Portia, Lady Justice, Pallas Athena, and Elohim Cyclopia. These are the members of the comic board. So in some instances, it, it's an eight-member panel. The, the situation can be so big and so great that you one single whole five star progression is not enough. Particularly if it's a repeat, because a lot of, again, as I said, you know, uh, there are very few times where I'm um, I'm taking someone in the past life regression where. There's not multiple lifetime where the same issue keep looping like an echo, keep coming back. So, and when this thing is immense, particularly when you're dealing with cosmic or celestial being that maybe um, that you may have tangled with in past lives, it's important for us to ask the comic board for help when we feel overwhelmed by how big it is. And the comic board can come in and through their special dispensation, they can remove or accelerate the removal of the entanglement. Any questions, any comments? All right, let's take a five minute break and then in the back end, we'll do a closing meditation. Five minutes.
Take a very deep and slow breath. And as you inhale and exhale deeply and slowly, allow the universal life force that permeates everything to enter into your lungs. Keep breathing deeply and slowly. And let your soul and your awareness drop in the middle of your chest. Please forgive me. I love you. And I let go. Please forgive me. I love you. And I let go. Let your mind and your heart sink with each other. Keep breathing deeply and slowly. Realize that you can perceive 360 degrees and notice what you notice. Become aware of any emotions, feelings, fears, victimization, and may want to show up for you. Keep breathing deeply and slowly. And remember that the discomfort is the teacher. Keep breathing deeply and slowly. And let your entire awareness locate where is discomfort.
What are you feeling? Is it one feeling? Or a combination of multiple feelings? What is the first feeling? The second feeling. Are there any other feelings? Have I ever felt this way before? What is the root cause of that feeling? What am I not seeing? What am I lying to myself about?
what is my 
Thank you for the blessings. I accept the gifts. And I receive with gratitude. Thank you for the blessings. I accept the gifts. And I receive with gratitude. Thank you for the blessings. I accept the gifts and I receive with gratitude. Take a very deep and slow breath. Whenever you feel ready, you can open your eyes. Well, thank you, Pierre. That was a very unusual experience for me, if I might just say. If there's such a thing as a karmic entanglement towards self from this life, that seems to be where I'm winding up. Wow. Wow. Well, this is a meditation you should continue. Yes. I definitely feel that. Yes, there's more to unravel. Yes. In that, but... Uh, I didn't know that would, that was even possible. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, there's something you're not seeing. The entanglement is connected to something else that's not visible right now. Mm -hmm. But that the emotion is hiding that entanglement. Do you understand what I'm saying? The what strange else? thing is that there wasn't an emotion. Mm. It, it's a health, a health condition. Yes, but the health condition is connected. Typically speaking, it's your emotional body that's sick. For, um, yeah, um, every disease comes um, from your form of dysfunction, something disconnecting in your emotional body. Oh, I mean? Okay, got it, got it. Thank you, that'll help. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, exactly. So okay. that's where it's coming from. It's the emotional body, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, all right. Yes, very important. Yes. And they are very powerful beings. They're all beings that are just, that are merciful, that are, you know, they're incredibly helpful. Yes, it definitely. Definitely. Well, I want to thank all of you for being with me tonight, uh, sending all my love. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you're on YouTube, like this video. Uh, on Patreon, thank you all for listening to me, sending you my deepest love, and I'll talk to you next week. Blessings, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Love you.